do I have potholes in my life? We would all say yes. Do I know how to deal with the potholes in my life? We'd all say no. I don't. And that is an honest answer. So one of the things that Pastor Al taught me is this. He said, in order for you to go, in order for you to lead a group of people someplace fresh under green pasture so they can grow and they can lead and they can be fed, the first thing is you have to go to the green pasture. You can sit around and you can eat dead grass all day long. But the dead grass is going to go away unless you go to where the green grass is. And in our life, we can be very complacent and stay exactly where we are, and we can live a complacent life and eating the same grass, doing the same thing every day, all day long, and be satisfied, but life is going to stink until we get out of the dead, mundane grass and move to greener pastures. And in his book, he's using that as a metaphor into uh, the highway and the potholes. I didn't know how to get out of him. You don't know how to get out of him. But he has given us the answer through the word of God is allow our heart to be transformed, contrite, broken, so God can give the glory and God can do the work. Uh, so today, we're going to do a brief uh, interview, and then Pastor Al is going to talk to us about his book on how to deal with the holy potholes of the Christian life. Let's make Pastor Al welcome as he comes up. Well, there you go. Hey, why don't you just keep on preaching? I enjoyed that. Well, after, last week, after last week, I decided not to. <laughs> um, wonderful book. Thank you. It's a wonderful book. You know, uh, it says here in the foreword that you have been in the ministry before you started this book about 45 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've been here how many years? Uh, we've been attending for eight and on staff for seven years. Wow. It seems like a lot you longer than that. You were just a young guy when I it came seemed, on. You know it seemed that? like a lot longer than you've <laughs> yeah, been here. Black it's like hair. you've been here for like 20 years or so. <laughs> um, you got out of Bible college. And I'm sure... You write out of Bible college with your gifts that you thought, uh, I'm going to start here and I'm going to end up running 600, 700,000 people, 5,000 people, and God's going to take care of me and it's going to be a wonderful street. Did that sure. work out for you? You know, actually, I, I really thought of 15,000 people. And um, oh, about right in the middle of my ministry, God took everything away from me and I didn't have anybody to pastor. And I was, uh, we was out in the Washington, D.C. area pastoring, and, and I remember we went out to the lake, my wife and I, and we took our kids, I think, that were still in high school. And I prayed, and I said, God, if you'd just give me five people, I'd be the happiest guy in the world. And so he had to, uh, you know, reveal to me, it's not about numbers, it's about people. Whoever you have there, minister to them, that's what he's all about. And so, no, it didn't work out that way. It really didn't. A lot of potholes that I went through. Actually, the first 15 years was really, as I mentioned to the first uh, group that was here, uh, excuse my language, but it was like hell. It really was. And uh, then my last uh, number of years, I really enjoyed it. I still had some potholes to go through. But um, uh, I asked the question on the book, does Christianity work or will it trip you up? And I got tripped up a few times. And uh, so we could talk a little bit about that a little, uh, later. Yeah. Did it work out okay for you? Well. Yeah, you shared a little bit of that. <laughs> but, uh, it, um, it's amazing uh, how many pastors uh, leave the ministry. And one of the reasons is because they've not been able to um, uh, understand the potholes. But not only pastors, but as we talked a little bit earlier, it's for all of us. And sometimes that's why we get out of a marriage. Sometimes that's why... Uh, we find our relationships just get broken up because we don't know how to negotiate those potholes. Mm -hmm. right. Well, the average pastor stays at his church for three to four years. The average church member leaves and moves churches every five years. Mm -hmm. right. So there's always mm -hmm. a, 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 a ebb and flow of people coming in and people leaving and, and not having that tight relationship. Mm -hmm. And I believe the potholes within the church in our, in our life is we have to deal with those relationally. 
No, absolutely. And as you talk from the head to head compared to heart to heart. Mm -hmm. So how is this book geared for pastors or is this book geared for Christians? Oh, it's geared for Christians. Um, it's good for pastors, but uh, what we talk about in this book is we oftentimes in our marriages, uh, you'll find it in the church. Uh, you'll probably find people sitting over here don't like people sitting over here. Well, I find somebody sitting here that don't even like the person sitting there. You do? <laughs> wow. <laughs> and so, see... Uh, that was a joke, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I know, but, okay. but, <laughs> but head to head is that we're going to be confrontational. Yeah. And now, in here we're not, but out on a golf course, <laughs> we work head to head out there, but we're not talking about the golf course, Okay. Uh, let's take that same scenario and put it in my marriage, and if I go head to head, I'm in trouble. And so we talk about heart to heart. No one in America today wants to sit down and listen to what the other person has to say because what we have to say is more important. And you'll find that in your marriage, in your home, your children. Uh, you find it in our churches today. No one wants to be a listener. The art of listening has uh, dissipated. Everybody has an opinion, and by doggies, I'm going to tell you what mine is, and I'm going to do it head to head. And so we have to learn. That's why we have so much conflict, not only in our personal lives, but in our relationships. Incidentally, you'll be voting on Tuesday, and isn't everything just pretty much head to head, and nothing is heart to heart? And so that's why in America we're in the condition we're in today. Nobody will listen to anybody else. Everybody else got all the answers. And so um, this, uh, this is in the book, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. One of the things that I think in this book that was eye-opening to me was the contrite heart, mm -hmm. how, to, how to deal with the brokenness of our life and how in that brokenness is when God does great things. And in our society today... Um, we are, we are a throwaway society. Sure. Uh, we, you know, computers, uh, laptops, uh, iPads, bicycles, TVs. We don't call a TV repairman anymore. We just mm -hmm. throw it out and sure. go to Walmart and buy another $300 TV. We don't, we don't fix things. And uh, we don't fix broken things, but I believe God only uses Absolutely. broken things. And I believe you taught us, or you will be teaching us in this book, how you can allow God to fix our hearts and our brokenness within our life mm -hmm. and i'm looking forward to that and uh, i'm looking forward to you sharing a little bit what's Good. in the book Good. okay God thank, bless you. You. thank you thank you love you i love to hear pastor bruce preach don't you well you probably have had some potholes in life when i was a teenager i grew up on a farm and um, every summer when it was hot and dry and all those farm trucks going down that, that road, sanded road, they would really get washboarded. And I tell you what, I mean, it, you, my dad had a 1950 Buick, and I was in high school. I was about um, just, well, actually, I wasn't in high school. I was just getting ready to go to high school. And I can remember getting in that old 50 Buick, and I mean, that thing would run. That, that thing would do 120 miles an hour. And I'd get that thing going across that washboard. I mean, I was just a flying across. I'd go a, con a whole mile. And every once in a while, he'd throw me over in the ditch, and <laughs> my dad went, well, what happened? I said, well, you know, I just got away from it. But, um, you know, that wasn't too bad, riding that old 50 Buick down potholes. And my wife and I have had the opportunity to be in every, all 50 states in America and a few uh, foreign countries, and um, had the opportunity to go to Romania back in the 1990s. And I don't know if you've ever been there or not, but it was right after uh, they had fallen, communism, and uh, so we, a bunch of missionaries and pastors were in this little old kind of a, a van type of thing. And, and every highway you went down in Romania, it would have a pothole as deep as this stool. And, you know, people walking along the side of the road with cows and pigs and horses. And we'd drive and try and miss all, negotiate all those potholes. And first thing you know, <laughs> missionary would hit a pothole and boom, everybody went up, hit the ceiling and back down. And, you know... And I got thinking about my life and it was just, uh, just a bunch of potholes. And to be honest with you, I didn't know what to do with them. And so I wanted to share just a few things with you this morning. And, and I'm not here really about the book. 
As I mentioned to the first service, um, if, I, if I was a rich man, I would just give everybody a copy of the book. And, um, but I, but I so happened God didn't bless me with that. But that's, that's fine. I don't mind that. And, uh, but there is um, a lot in this book that I think would be very valuable for anyone here that you really have a difficult time trying to figure out what life is all about. And so I'm going to put a, um, a scripture up on the screen, Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 23. And it's kind of the very essence of, our, um, of what we want to talk about today. Um, I don't know, it was uh, Tom Landry used to um, be the coach of Dallas Cowboys. It's a team down south, kind of a little league type of team. Have you ever heard of the Dallas Cowboys? You know what I'm talking about? Well, Tom Landry used to wear that, you know, that Sunday go to meeting hat and be on the sideline. And somebody asked him one day, uh, what's the difference between a, a good football player and a great football player? And he said, well, I've got the answer for that. He said, a good football player has a lot of knowledge up here in the head about football. He knows how to play football. He knows everything. He knows where he goes down, makes his cut, everything about football. And they said, well, what makes a great football player? And Tom Landry said, 18 inches. 18 inches? What do you mean? 18 inches. He said, good football players play from the head, and great football players play from the heart. 18 inches from here to here. And I began to realize, and I use that example in my book, that we have so much knowledge about the Bible today. I, I mean, you can, you can go on the Internet, iPhones, any place that you want to go, you can find writings about spiritual matters. In America, if information was the most important thing about Christianity and me growing as a Christian, then we should be the most spiritual people in the world. But the fact of the matter is we're not. And the problem is we don't know how to take the Word of God from the head to the heart. And you say, what difference does that make? Because it's Delhi. I've got knowledge about God. I know theology. I know there everything I need to know about the Bible. Well, here's the problem. Things don't issue out of the head. Life doesn't issue out of the head. The Bible says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So what makes a great Christian is not one that has a lot of information up here. That's good to have the information, and we should. We want to have a desire to learn more about God. What makes a great Christian is one that has learned to take the information and put it into the heart and to live Christianity. That means that you forgive people. That means that husbands, you love your wives. That means that everything that the Bible talks about, do not worry, do not be anxious, that you don't worry. It means that you've learned how to take the wonderful Word of God and all of the promises and all of the commands that God gives to us of being a Christian and you've put it into your heart, and now you can live it. See, you know what my heart is like. I don't hide that. You see my heart by the things that I do and by the things that I say. When I get angry and I say things to you I should not say, you know my heart. When I do something to someone, then you realize, and it's something that is, is, is damaging to them, then you know my heart because out of my heart I did what I did. And so I want to just share a few things. If you would want to purchase a book, that's fine. If you don't, uh, it's interesting when you write a book. I, I brought some this morning. I told Shorty, I said, I bet nobody will buy that book. See why I'm not in sales? <laughs> I knock up on door and I, well, you probably don't want to buy this, do you? So, so it's on Amazon, and, and it went on a couple of weeks ago, and I thought, there will be nobody in the world will ever buy that book off of Amazon. And so every day I'd go on Amazon. No, nobody, zero, big goose egg. Nobody bought my book. And so I went on last night, and they, somebody, there's five copies sold. Five, that's ten. There's five copies that were sold. 
That's why they don't buy my book. I don't know how to count. There were five, there were five copies that were sold. I thought. And then I got to thinking, you know, I'd lay in bed at night and I'd think, maybe somebody will buy a thousand copies. Wouldn't that be great? Maybe some bookstore will buy a thousand copies and put it in their bookstore. Man, I thought, that'd be great. And then I thought, oh, man. I saw somebody on the Internet the other day. They were complaining to Amazon and said, I've got a book on there and I haven't sold any. I thought, yeah, that's me. I won't sell any. Then I saw these last night, and I went to bed last night, and I said, you know, they probably spent $15 for that book, and they'll read that thing, and they'll probably say, man, that was money down the hole, wasn't it? <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe one person would like my book. But I want to just uh, talk about a few things that's in the book, and then I want to talk about God and what he does in our life. Um, there's a couple things that I think are important to life, and one of them is uh, how our relationships are built. Uh, if you put those up, the first one is, Oftentimes, and we talked about that a few minutes ago, our relationships are built upon head-to-head -head relationships. And um, I think that in the book we talk about this, the difference between a head-to-head -head relationship. My wife and I, we've learned this a long time ago, that um, if we have a head-to-head -head relationship, if you go to the dictionary, it means that is a, a, a conflicting relationship. You're just constantly head-to-head -head with each other. And what that means is the fact that if she's talking to me, I'm not listening to her because I have something I need to say to her because what I say is more important than what she says. And, and she uh, thinks the same thing. And so because of that, we're bucking heads. We're head to head with each other. And, and so most of our relationships are built that way. It happens in the church. Oftentimes people leave the church because they had a relationship here, but it was all head to head. What they, what they believed was the most important thing, what the other person believes isn't important at all. And so what you learn is as you begin to develop your heart from out of the heart issues life, now I have to have a relationship with her heart to heart. What I have to think is not always the most important. Sometimes what she thinks is more important. And like I said to the first service, that um, she can talk to me as long as I'm not watching TV, okay? But outside of that, then we, we're pretty much heart to heart. Otherwise, it's head to head. And so... I think it's very important if you, if you do buy the book, take a moment and really think about your relationships on the job. I bet there's people on your job where you work, you just cannot stand or just are constantly bucking heads. And so maybe you can learn to come from the heart and that you would have a heart-to-heart -heart relationship. The second thing in the book I'd really like for you to examine, I think is so important, is called the spirit of the mind or the mind of the spirit. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians that my mind has a spirit of its own. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians, it says for you to take off the old and put on the, the new. In between those two verses is the verse that said that first, the spirit of the mind must be changed. And what I mean by the spirit of mind, my mind, Al Schusler has a spirit of his own. I have an opinion about everything. I don't care what it is, abortion, politics, a church work, I mean, I'll put it out there for you. A lot of people go out on Facebook, and that's a spirit of their mind. There it is. Well, what we need to do is to change that for the mind of the spirit. And uh, that is found in the book of Romans, in chapter number 8, verse 26 and 27. And so that is very important. And then the last um, uh, thing that I really encourage you to examine is these two words, appropriation and assimilation. And appropriation is just simply this. I, um, I've shared this with you many times. My mother was a worry ward. And every time she'd come to our house and she'd get ready to leave, she said, boy, I sure smell gas in here today. You sure you don't have a gas leak somewhere? You know, and then we'd spend the rest of the week. We didn't want to light a match around there because we figured maybe there's gas. And then she'd come maybe for a meal and she'd come and she'd get ready to leave and she'd leave. Boy, I sure smell gas in your house. So then we spent another two weeks. Nobody wanted to light a match so we couldn't do anything. Well, it's genetic, and so I ended up with worry. But I, I, I read the, the Bible one day, and it said that we're not to be anxious. We're not to worry. That's what God said. He said, if you just give everything to me through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, then the peace of God's going to come upon your life. And I said, wow, man, that's great. I used to preach on that. I tell you, I could really preach some great sermons on that. 
if I didn't, I couldn't live it, but I could preach great sermons. And so appropriation just simply means I looked at that and I looked at my life and here I was just worried about everything and I thought something's not matching up here. And I knew I had the information up here, do not worry, but I couldn't put it into my heart, into my life. And so I began to have a desire to appropriate that to my life. And the word appropriation means to make it yours. It's a promise God has given you. You claim it by faith. See, I had a, a, a misunderstanding of faith. I thought when I first came to Jesus Christ, I put my faith in him, and that took care for the rest of my life until I died and went to heaven. Well, I realized that everything in the Bible, every promise, do not worry. Al had to look at that, and by faith I had to say, God, I want that promise. I want that life. I had to appropriate it and claim it, and then I had to assimilate it into my life. It's very much like eating food. When you assimilate food, you, it becomes a part of you. It filters out into your body. Well, the same thing is true with the Word of God as you read the Word of God. You assimilate the Word of God. And so you make it yours, it assimilates into your life, and now instead of going through life with all this worry, I've been able to overcome that because I took it from here to my heart. And so it's, it's, it's valuable. I wish somebody would have taught this to me when I was sitting in church as a young man. I always told my wife, those preachers used to tell me how to die. No one ever told me how to live. And I, I just missed out on that somewhere. So I struggled with life, and I shared with the service a few minutes ago, and I've shared this before, that our little grandbaby was born with water on the brain in the early 80s and died after he was three years old and it just devastated me i was such a broken man i went into a deep deep depression i'd never been there before and i've never been there since but it was so deep i'd go out to the cemetery where my mom and dad were buried and and our little grandbaby and i'd just go out there for hours and just sit on the gravestone and oh i just i just hurt so bad when i experienced that and I, when I was a teenager, I used to help my dad farm, and out in the middle of an intersection, or out in the middle of a section of land, I drove my pickup back into the area where nobody would know where I was. My wife didn't know where I was. and I sat back there all day, and I just, oh, I hurt so much. It just, and I didn't, to be honest with you, I was ready to give up pastoring. I was ready to give up on Christianity. I didn't want anything to do with it. It tripped me up. And then I just, I, you know, I, I want to walk away from it. And I got to thinking about Christianity, and, and it really, I don't know why it sets you up this way, but Christianity is really designed to set us up for conflict. Now, it wasn't that way in the Garden of Eden. There was utopia, and yet there was conflict. And everything that happens in your life, there's going to be conflict. A man meets a woman, they get married, there's going to be a conflict. Then you decide to have a family and you got kids, guess what? Those little rascals are going to bring some conflict into your home, aren't they? You bet they do. And now you got not only husband and wife fighting, now you got the kids fighting. You say, well, let's go to church, man. Everything will be a utopia. The church, we'll go there, we'll sit in the pew, and we'll be real nice. And you get there and Church is set up for a conflict. You have leadership. You got people sitting in the pew. You got uh, all kinds of things. You take up an offering, and well, there's going to be a conflict. You know, you're talking about money now, and everything I looked at was was going to be a conflict. And so I, that's where I was living, and I didn't want that for my life. I knew if I ended up. In my 80s or 90s, someday, I would be a bitter old man having to fight all these conflicts that I've had. Well, let me show you the life that I really wanted. And it's found in um, the book of Galatians. It's the fruit of the Spirit. This was the life that I desired. I wanted to be a man of love. I really wanted to love my wife like I knew God wanted me to love her. I wanted to be a man of joy. I wanted to be happy. 
But I wanted more than happiness. I wanted joy. So many people do not have joy in our society today. I wanted that joy. I wanted peace. Do you know why there is so much agitation in our society today, driving down the interstate, walking into the Walmart, into the school, into the churches, no matter where you go, politicians, all kinds of slamming each other. Why do we live that way? Why do we want to live that way? Why wouldn't we want to live in peace? But see, the human nature takes us in the other direction. So I wanted love and joy and peace. I wanted to be gentle. I wanted to be patient, long-suffering with people. I wanted to be kind. I wanted to have some self-control so the world didn't take over and control my life. I wanted to have faith. I wanted all that. Meekness. I wanted meekness. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is someone that is in control of things, and yet they're very meek. Jesus was a meek person. Don't, don't ever think he was a weak person. He went to the cross, and he carried that heavy cross up to that hill. He died for the sins of mankind. Jesus was meek, but he wasn't weak. I wanted to be that person. I didn't know how to go there. Second Chronicles chapter 20, we have the story of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was very transparent. And as I mentioned many, many times, I have enjoyed watching the transformation our pastor has made the last number of years of somebody that has been transparent. Um, you know, it's not easy to walk up on this platform Sunday after Sunday and, and speak. Uh, he's much like I am. We're both very bashful. We're both very quiet. I didn't know that of him until we went to a funeral in Winfield a few years ago. And we were driving down the highway, and he said, when we get there, I want to sit in the back row. What? Well, you want to sit in the back? I just don't like meet new people. What? You don't like meet new people? I, I didn't see you as being somebody like that. But that's what we are. And so Jehoshaphat had a, a, a pothole in front of him, a battle. The news came. The armies are coming. And Jehoshaphat didn't know what to do. He did pray. And then he cried out to God and he said, God, I don't have the power to do anything. And then he said what no man probably would ever want to say, and if I had the power, I don't know what to do. And I've always said that's the best place that any person could ever find themselves. And when they have to say, I don't know what to do, and if I knew what to do, I cannot do that. But we live in America. We can do anything. We know how to do it. And so our children grew up that way. And then they start hitting the potholes. They begin to wonder what's going on in life. And Jehoshaphat. And I learned two verses, and I'd like to share with them, and then I'll close in just a few minutes. The first one is this. It's found um, um, in the scriptures that we're going to put up here on the, uh, on the screen. The first one is, I don't have the power to do it. Now, notice the first verse on this. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. I've used that in the signing of my books that he would grant you, Al, that he would grant Al, just you, I know there's 7 billion people in the world, but Al, that he would grant Al, according to the riches of God's glory, for Al to be strengthened with might by, his, by God's spirit in Al's inner man. And when I learned that, I learned what it was to go from here to here. I had all the knowledge. I didn't have the power. And then as we read through that scripture, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you, Al, might be filled, that you, Al, that Al might be filled with all the fullness of God. 
that I could be filled with all the fullness of God? God, I don't see how that could be possible. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding above, abundantly above all that Al could ever ask of him or could ever even think according to the power that worketh in Al. Wow. Did that ever change and transform my life to know now when I face the potholes of life, I don't have to do it by myself. I have an inner power. I have the power of God within me to strengthen me, the fullness of God to see me through the potholes of life. And then last of all, secondly, I don't know what to do. I found the answer to that. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Lord whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and he shall bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So, I had the opportunity to go to a one-room schoolhouse four years, one teacher. Remember, her husband used to come, put the flag up, and we'd go out and do the uh, Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. That, that was fun, one-room schoolhouse. And I begin to realize with God, and I've had a lot of teachers in my life, and I, I've mentioned this before to the teachers that are here today, I just really admire what you do. You put out a lot of information in the minds and hearts of little kids, and that's great in teenagers, whatever it might be. I've sat under theologians. I've sat under Bible professors. I've sat under preachers, evangelists, missionaries. All of them gave me information up here. But there came a time in my life when God said, Al, I'm going to send you back to one-room schoolhouse. And there's only going to be one student, and it's you. And God said, I'm going to be the teacher. I want to teach you something. And so God was able to take all the information I had up here, and he would teach me and say, now this is how it works in your life. He shall teach you all things. And so a Christian ought not to go around bragging about how smart we are when it comes to the Bible. I know the Bible. I know all about the Bible. I know about God. Really, we know just a small amount about the God of this universe. It's not about up here. It's about can I live what I believe up here. And so I'd like to share one more scripture with you, and it's found in Psalm 51, 17. What God is interested in for me is not, boy, you can build a great church. You're a great communicator. You're a great teacher. You're a great father, great husband. He, uh, that's not what he's looking for. He's looking for a broken heart. And as you go through your brokenness, and you will, it may be at different levels, but you will, and you may, le you may read this book and you may say, I don't understand that at all. Be very much like when I read Watchman Nee's book, The Normal Christian Life. I didn't understand it. Until finally I went through brokenness and I opened it up and said, ah, ah, there it is right there. I missed it somewhere. No one ever taught me about that. And so I'd like to, I'd like to close with a challenge to every one of you here today. I think sometimes that we get lax lackadaisical in what we're doing. I, I do that, uh, you know, I'll be 77 next year, and I, I get less, like the days ago, I'm going to have to work on that word. Anyhow, it means I just, I just kind of sit back and don't do anything, okay? And I think sometimes that we do that as a church. We just, we just don't really get involved. We come to church on Sunday morning. We may read the Bible at home. We may pray. But I'm talking about the excitement of church. I'm talking about the excitement of God. And so I really want to challenge it. There are a lot of young couples sitting here. Boy, I can remember my wife and I, we were young, and I can remember when we first started going back to church and really got interested in spiritual things, and, and we were so excited about that. But, you know, today, 2014, I want God to do things in my life, don't you? I have a great desire for that. I know he is not yet through with my life. And I live for that. I want to see what God's going to do. It may be painful. 
I understand that. But no matter what it is that comes into my life, I've learned it may be painful, but God is going to use it. And when I get through that situation, I'm going to look back and say, God, it was so painful. But thank you for helping me through that pothole that almost destroyed my life. Caleb had great passion. He wanted that mountain. And the older I get, the more I want that. The more my wife and I, we enjoy each other. 56 years together, we just, you know, we just pinch each other once in a while. Are we real? Is this, you know, what God's doing in our life? But we've made it exciting. I'll just throw this in and I'll then close and Pastor Bruce come. You know, guys, you really lose your romance is what happens. And if you've lost that in your marriage, now this is all free, it's not going to cost you anything, okay? If you've lost that romance in your marriage, you have become lackadaisical. Never lose that passion that you have for your marriage and for your wife. And the same thing is true, the passion that you have for God. Does Christianity work? You bet it does. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for just the opportunity of speaking on your behalf. God, I love you tremendously today. And Father, um, it's been a great journey. I wouldn't have missed it for anything. But Father, I want you to have the glory because only you deserve the glory for anything that's ever happened in our lives. Father, I just pray that maybe those here today going through potholes, not knowing how to negotiate them, but work through them and around them. And I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would be the great teacher in their lives right now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Al. Let's give him a round of applause. <clears throat>